So welcome everybody to the New York Institute of Technology and its fall 2020 lecture series in the School of Architecture and Design. So this is our third installment of our uh, lectures and we have a number of um, events that are still remaining for the semester. Our next lecture is by Nada Basugian on October 21st. And then the next is by Francis Campani and Michael Schwarting on November the 4th. Then we have Kaiwe Bergman on November 10th. And then our own Hante Zhang on November 11th. And then we also have two other events. We have Data Matter Design, Strategies in Computational Design, a book launch moderated by Professor Marcella Del Signore on October 28th, and then Urbanism of Southern China Metropolis on November 18th. Mm. And those will be excellent events, and I hope you have time to uh, attend. So tonight we have Professor Jonathan Friedman, who will discuss his research and work on synagogue. Uh, following the lecture will be Professor David Diamond, who will be responding to Professor Friedman's lecture and moderating questions from the audience. So please enter your questions into the chat after the lecture or, or during the lecture so you don't forget what your questions might be. And then we'll take them in line um, after, after Jonathan is complete. So Professor Friedman studied at Cambridge and Princeton University where he studied with Kenneth Frampton, Peter Eisenman, Michael Graves, and Charles Guafney. He's a licensed architect both in Kentucky, where he taught at the University of Kentucky, and in New York, where he has spent over 30 years here at New York Tech as a full professor, teaching design studio and history theory courses. He was the first, he was the first year studio coordinator for many years and was the dean of the School of Architecture from 1992 to 2000. Jonathan was the first professor I met at NYIT. In his usual incantation, he not only delivered facts and figures, but also the spirit and tribulation of what it takes to be an architect. While I did not have him as a professor, he has had a profound influence on my education uh, and my evolution as a teacher. I learned from his book, Creation in Space, Fundamentals of Architecture, first published in 1989, that architecture is something you acquire through experience rather than simply reading about it. This helped me shape my understanding that architecture is equally about imagination, visualization, order, construction, perception, tactility, history, theory, and so much more. I later discovered that many schools of architecture across the country had used his book and their students had similar, similar sets of experiences. I learned about teaching from his book, understanding it not as a set of gestalt diagrams or modernist foreplay, but a cognitive journey in the makings and discourse on architecture. It was the many readings of this book that excited my imagination as a student and that I continue to use in conversation with my own students today. I also learned from Jonathan an appreciation of jazz, particularly Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk, the bebop, melodic impro improvisation, syncopations, substitutions, asymmetry, and harmony, the melody of composition. I believe a love of music resonates throughout his work. Tonight we will see a series of projects that for Jonathan he cares most deeply about, the idea of synagogue. Not for the express interest in manifesting these works as buildings, but as architectural investigations that might answer questions. How can a synagogue be formed and its corollary? What spaces and relations of meaning configure a community? Unlike the consequence and the destruction of the Tower of Babel, we architects speak a common language. Jonathan tells us program, site, and form intersect as a set of volumes and a fabric of the continuum of, pla of plastic mass and void via material, light, color, structure, etc. We must also speak of having an accord with nature. The union of idea and reason deserves the architect's most compassionate care and attention. The word alphabet comes from the Greek word alphabetos, a combination of alpha, meaning the beginning, and beta, meaning the second of many things. So many things, in fact, Victor Hugo remarked that human society, the world, and the whole of mankind is to be found in the alphabet. 
In an alphabet, letters arranged in a specific order are used for reading and writing a language. In ordering form around these letters or symbols transcribed through our intimate relation with the earth and sky, Friedman presents to us a reading of architecture. It is one that is rich in connotation and progression as it attempts to define the meaning of synagogue. The work assembles a congregation of indispensable characters in the language of architecture, circle, square, triangle, arranged in topographical juxtaposition within a landscape of conscious and subconscious imaginations. These characters like the Aleph, Be'et, A as the ox and B as the house can also be symbols or figures, earth, man, sky, or dance, field, structure, etc. Synagogue is a monumental undertaking. We might be reminded of Louis Kahn's Mikvah Israel and the majesty of the hollow column or the Beth Shalom, Frank Lloyd Wright's otherworldly illuminated pyramid or perhaps Symbolista by Mario Babota with its circle square transit of light. These projects are imaginations of pure space and form, another thing Jonathan cares deeply about. Space is an ongoing theme in Friedman's work, be it contrapositions of sol solid and void or of space and time, he cultivates a vision that tries to capture or unleash the vastness of the holy universe. He and his work tell us that there's significance and character in each Hebrew letter. When Aleph was completed, Be'et, the second letter, beckoned. These projects take a long time. They are broadly researched and deeply considered creations. Without normal reasoning for architecture, no client, site, or budget, they arrive at a synthetic inevitability, which takes thought and lots of time. Each one in a series has taken over, on average, three years to complete. Fortunately, there are only 22 letters in the Hebrew Aleph Be'et. Please welcome Jonathan Friedman, who will present his work, quite possibly in alphabetical order. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. That was incredibly erudite and kind and interesting. And I hope I can live up to any small part of that um, maybe get past Olive on to bait uh, with the things that you talk about. I'm touched to see so many old friends here and it's such a strange event to be part of. Uh, not, not the lecture series, but to do it this way is so odd in our lives that um, it's still, it's all new. And for an old guy like myself, uh, a lot of the technology is new. I hope that uh, if there anything goes wrong, you'll bear with me. But I think, it, I think it should be fairly cooked. So we'll hope for the best. And thank you, Pablo, for arranging this and managing it and keeping everything up and running. And uh, what say we get started? I'm going to try to get you to look at my screen. And I'm going to share some... Um, uh, let's see. Um, let's try this. So, uh, do you see um, a picture of a car on the left and a person on the right? Is that up and running? Yes. Okay, and I, have, and I haven't lost uh, audio contact with you. Those are things that it's hard to get feedback. You know, there's no mirroring. We don't know what's going on. Okay, well, this is where we start. So um, this is my first slide of quite a few. And I, I thank you, Rob. Thank you, Pablo, again. Um, and I want to thank also Maria and Junius and Hank for their leadership to keep us all going these days. And Tom, uh, I thank you as well for helping me through some of this. Um, and I appreciate the school's continuing support that has facilitated much of the work that you ha will see tonight. So I'm going to start now. These are dark times. Is there any ray of light? Here, now, at this moment, does making things mean anything at all? I'm sorry I missed the Campo Baeja, or however you say that, lecture last Wednesday. Uh, his elegant and powerful work is full of light, and uh, we need a lot of that these days. 
and he advised uh, omit needless words. So I'll try my best to do that. But as his country, uh, his countryman, uh, uh, Francesco Goya once showed us, when Kronos is devouring um, his children, we all ache. Sorry, I'm just getting something here. Tonight, I propose to explore an idea about thesis as a kind of uh, framework for idea about synagogue. And I'll do it in terms of a mind following its own path over the, over the course of a lifetime. A quick sampling of what I have been drawn to, my mind has been, and what I made out of that from time to time. Some of it might at least roughly be equivalent to a thesis and others are mere meanderings of a human imagination. And since I'm grateful that many of my thesis students are here, I am particularly uh, concerned that we can take advantage of this as something that moves us along. These days, locked into our spaceship homes, we may turn inward to look deeper into who we are. We as architects uh, may find answers in our work. For example, like a thesis. Needless to say, everything you see here tonight uh, is a product of a fair amount of work. So what is a thesis? To me, a thesis is informed conjecture, informed by research, question and experiment, invention, design, synthesis. An architectural thesis is a plastic synthesis in the medium of human scaled habitable space. Maybe it starts and ends with curiosity. What is wrong with this picture, this slide? Well, on the left, it ain't Earth, because in that photo, we're looking at Earth, so it's gotta be somewhere else, or an Earth-like planet. It's not here. And on the right, that man in the Earth, not man in the moon, um, that uh, is a conjunction of the uh, continent of Africa and uh, a skull from Africa, Homo erectus, uh, who was the first human ancestor to spread from Spain to Java and has the earliest use of fire. Now, fire, that was a thesis, I think, fire. Uh, and it's amazing, this skull continent montage. Does it mean anything? No, nah, I don't know. But I think it does tickle the eye. But you have to look and think at the same time, which I think is a prerequisite and a kind of fact of curiosity. So here are my earliest essays in the thesis genre, or some of the early ones. And pre-thesis as a kid, uh, these log sticks would pile together, but they'd fall apart, this wonderful building toy. And one day I figured out a way to lock them together with an XYZ intersection so that they didn't fall apart. And I could use them as a vertical mask with a knot that could be the spars for something that wasn't just a pile, but had a kind of three-dimensional uh, uh, structural presence. I think that was an invention. I was very proud of that. And then around the age of 11, I made this shack out of balsa wood and paper, and I made the drawings for it. It had gutters and downspouts, stairs, hinged door, toolbox, where I had them once, a long time ago. And 11 years later, my official MR thesis uh, with, as uh, uh, Rob pointed out, Michael Graves was my thesis advisor, and it was called Metro North River Community for the East Bronx of New York. It was a very weak project, I have to admit. It was not, not the best, but eventually, when I split for the coast, as we used to say, uh, I made a building or at least a construction that I could stand in. And it was a greenhouse in Woodside, California, uh, in lieu of uh, a month's rent. And it was a tensegrity with leather hinges and wood uh, structural uh, pieces. And I should have become a realtor in Woodside, California at that point. It would have been a very smart move. Could have done a lot of building any way I wanted after that. But then there were other steps towards architecture. When I was in Kentucky teaching, I, uh, some homes appeared or I worked on making some. With my students in a class, we had a class that built a house. It was a pole house. So our group was called Lonesome Pole Cats, of course. And then for a fellow academic, um, I built a house as well. He's sitting here with his dog on the porch in the unfinished photos of the project. But in addition to construction, there were also speculations. And this is one 
that was part of my preoccupation with space for a long time. I wanted to be a spaceman when I was a kid and then certainly wanted to have space suits. So what would it be like? What would a zero gravity sport be like? I propose space ball with an SP, space ball. The goal is at the center of the sphere, the goal for the sport, uh, marked by XYZ intersecting lasers, and you are the ball. So the idea is to get through that point any way you can. And the, it seems to me it would be a combination of gymnastics, billiards, roller derby. It could be singles, doubles, teams, maybe some version of Ender's Game, but more, more pure because it's in a sphere and you just got to get to the center someday. Or maybe Astro Golf uh, with heavy golf balls here made to look like Earth. They have to be heavy because to respond to the asteroid's nanogravity, they ain't going to do much curving otherwise, but maybe there can be other controls. And there's the, the, the hole and the, and the so-called flag in this uh, vacuum atmosphere. And perhaps in the background here, that's the back nine on another asteroid somewhere in the distance. And later I did something called Earthlight Lodge, actually did it here at NYIT. Uh, it's a lunar sightseers resort. And you can see it here by the red dots uh, in section and elevation in the 3000 meter high wall of Aristarchus crater. It's 18 stories high, this tiny little figure in this wall uh, with hotel corridors six stories high because in the moon's one sixth of earth gravity, eight inch risers become 48 inch risers. So you can take a step and you're four feet up and another step gets you to the next level of bedrooms or whatever. So the corridor, could be six stories high because if you could jump and touch a corridor on an earth hotel, you could touch the, the ceiling of the corridor on a, on a lunar hotel that's six times that high. So you could have, so this hotel has three corridors for its 18 floors of hotel rooms and then a central lobby that's 18 stories high. And you could jump off and float in that and float up and down carrying either uh, hot air balloons or, or, or having the right kind of soaring uh, clothing. The waterfall is slow because of gravity. And although, uh, and because uh, what we see on Earth is always the same face of the moon, that means on the moon, what you would look at is an Earth that never moves in the sky. It's always in the same position, depending on where you are in longitude and latitude on the, on the moon. And so it would be still, but it would be animated because we have uh, weather. So you could watch a storm cross Florida in two hours on this stationary Earth. This won an honorable mention in a competition. It was published in Ad Astra, which means to the stars. But the real prize for me and my space interests was this holy grail of space memorabilia, as it's been called. My personal signed letter from Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. He was politely declining an invitation when I was the uh, lectures, lectures and exhibition uh, uh, coordinator at, at, at University of Kentucky as, an, as a faculty member. But he signed it and it's addressed to me. When I was working with the Lonesome Pellcats up on the unfinished roof deck of our uh, construction, I was reading Michael Collins carrying the fire. Michael Collins was the command module pilot who orbited the moon while Neil Armstrong and um, uh, 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 Buzz Aldrin landed. And he said that he wanted to do what, uh, uh, he wanted everyone to see the beautiful jewel of earth that he see, saw when he finally came back from the moon to, uh, to our home planet. And that was a big deal for him because when he orbited behind the moon and he was the first person to be out of radio contact with the earth, it was when Armstrong and Aldrin landed and he didn't know if they crashed. And if they crashed, his command module would not have the power that the lunar module would give to that combination to get them out of the lunar orbit and back to earth. So he would never have made it back to earth if they had crashed. And he didn't know that for about 25 minutes or 30 minutes on the dark side of the moon. So I wondered how we could uh, make this vision and I invented something called Earth Photo Globe. I think I see Ivan Kreitman in the audience. Thank you for your help on this project, Ivan. That was really wonderful. I made the drawings, got three patents. I did these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, patent drawings here. They're all mine. I learned the rules of patent drawing when I did it. And if only I had included in the application for the patents 
uh, that you could do this on a computer graphic screen or a computer screen with the proper, proper graphics. But it was before that was possible. This is going back quite a way. And they didn't have such a thing, at least not publicly available. And I'll show you what the state of the art was even later than this. Otherwise, if, they, if I had been able to say that, these patents would have uh, preceded and maybe ultimately been something that had to do uh, with Google Earth. But I did get to meet Michael Collins. And I asked him about what it was like to be on the far side of the moon alone. And he said, well, you know, it's like when you're out in a rowboat in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on a moonless but clear night. And you look up and all you see are stars. And I thought, well, I've never been a Navy SEAL, but I'll say, yes, I know what it's like to be on a rowboat like that. And he said, well, it was like that, except when you look down, all you see is stars. And I went, oh. And that's what I know about being in space. And it was worth the trip, even if we didn't get the patent. And another project way ahead of its time was my proposal for golf graphics. In 1982, ABC Sports told me that if they couldn't get the instant replay within five seconds, they couldn't use it. And these line drawings here are the state of the art of computer graphics at that moment. And this was really state of the art that I was working with. Uh, so needless to say, now this is a very common event on uh, TV golf, but again, it was before its time. And here's another little invention, uh, a, a color aid pen with hundreds of colors, needs a special centrifuge to make it work, and it never came into being. I designed this school in East Orange, New Jersey. I'm proud of the clever part T that arranged the volumes so that it would both answer the 1,500 students in six particular spaces with a spine of services uh, that corresponded to the site that allowed the space of the roadway in the neighborhood to work its way through the building. And although we were quite required to have quite a bit more outdoor play space, but there wasn't enough room on the site, for that, we did get permission to build a roof terrace garden playground with a ramp up to it and then a series of ramps that took you further as the bridges and connections. And here and here were the cafeterias that opened out onto that for the students and the staff of the school. It was an architectural idea for sure. Was it a thesis? It's still a question. I don't know what you'd call that. Maybe if I had proposed that as a thesis, I could maybe graduate. And here's a home at, I did roughly the same time uh, in Edgewater, New Jersey. Um, it was a private home. And you see the before and after on a very tight site, very tight site, uh, with a great view of the skyline of New York right on the water. And my associate on this project uh, and rescuer in many ways, although she was faithful to the design, was the late and great architect Michelle Bertone. And then this is what I should have done for my thesis. Uh, by the way, I have to ask, are you seeing the full double page spread or are you seeing images of yourselves? No, we were wondering if you could um, blow up the main image because we're seeing your notes. We're seeing the two slides. Oh, really? I'm sorry. Yeah. Of course. God damn. Probably you should have told me before. Yeah, um, but I didn't want to interrupt you. So. Oh, but okay, let's do it this way. Are you seeing the big yes. one now? Yes. Okay, and are you seeing the pictures of people? No, you see the full image. But this is the way it works. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's I thought fine. I had that set up. Oh my God, all those things that you lost. All no, right, but we'll we move saw, ahead. We saw, don't worry, because we saw the images. We saw all oh, okay. the images. The yeah, but small. you also read what I was about to say, which is not so, but so that's, good. That's but that's no okay. problem. No problem. I, I hope it was yeah. small enough for you to read it. All right, let's keep moving no. on. Okay. Then this is what I should have done for my thesis. Now you won't know what I'm going to say, but you'll probably guess. Um, and I'll read on this one. Doing things right means living as though your grandchildren would also be alive in this land, carrying on the work we are doing right now with deepening delight, wrote the poet Gary Snyder in 1977. So my project here is called Home for Generations. And the idea, the conception, was to dig a hole in the ground, pile the dirt on the north side, build a retaining wall, paint it black, put glass over it, make it a tram wall, and then you have the makings of a home where the systems of dwelling space and services and power and all the rest could grow independently of each other. And this idea of the cut and fill would create a landscape of loftiness and depth, which is the opposite of the flattened and flattening suburbia. And biology. At this time, I got married and started a family. So 
you see the preoccupation with both conception and an embryology of dwelling. This maps a six phase project that takes you from one person to up to 36 and more people on the same site on an acre and a half that could be built over many generations and become that extended family, maybe not, you know, physically, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever, communities, uh, a state. And uh, more or less at every level of, of uh, uh, completion, if you pack these things together, it maintains the same density, which is higher than Levittown. It would be a palazzo for every suburban dwelling. Privacy, you can only see the forest behind your neighbor to the south, and it separates cars and people, but without elevated roadways, you can see right here and here and there and there again, that um, the uh, uh, road uh, drives above where the people could go, which is a space that essentially is an opened out garage excavation, I mean, not garage, basement excavation, uh, sub subfloor, where the south side of that basement lets the light in and becomes an acre field that you have in front of your house. And uh, you would accomplish the, this uh, way of having the people in the car separate by dropping culverts in the roadways uh, uh, across uh, the roads, which I'll show you in a second, um, much like the uh, way that you have the underpasses at the Jones Beach parking lots. Okay, so I'm moving along. Um, this is a middle density settlement pattern. That's the roadways I'm talking about. And it's not urban, not rural, but it's common in the world. I think it's the result of distributed private vehicle travel or what we call suburbia. And here are some details. A rule of thumb, one car's photovoltaic roof yields a day's commute in an electric car for suburbia. And that was using Department of Energy figures for solar panels back in inefficient 1978 and more. If the first shovelful is dug in exactly the right place, then everything grows just the way you want it to. Please watch the flag in this second phase, which is two stories, a two by two by two cube, as that gets bigger and goes to three stories. The flag telescopes up higher, the flagpole, and the flag blows higher in the greater winds up there further. The garage grows from one bay to two bays and ultimately to six bays for parking and photovoltaic power. And um, here's some studies. I've been asked to make some of these larger. So here you get a chance to see some of these of the model in more detail or a model in more detail. Since embryology of dwelling showed constant density, you can mix and match all these phases for individualized communities, as I was suggesting. Private homes, co-housing, dorms, assisted living could be in that space um, there. And what happens to my laser pointer? Right there. When Tom Swazi was the Nassau County Executive, he kindly appointed me Senior Advisor for Planning, a title with no function. And uh, I, we almost got to the point where we did a demonstration of this home for generations. Uh, it might have been somewhere on the parking lot of, Colise of the Coliseum, which is right here in Nassau County. And it was going somewhat along, but then he lost the next election as uh, county executive. He's now the um, uh, uh, con congressman, but he lost that election. So we haven't done that. And here's a study about section, which I won't go into now and some more drawings and just to attempt to catch up a little bit with our time. Uh, this project could work on the moon and elsewhere. The bubble would grow as the trees and the fields and the oxygen making plants would grow, making more oxygen for a bigger atmosphere as the time goes on. So here you have the home for generations, a project from beginning to end perhaps. Is it a thesis? Well, my measure of that would be, would it get me an M arch? I think so, I think it would, I think it fits in that category. Would it get you an M-Arch? I don't know. Uh, we'll have to see about that. But time does cook you. So while all this was going on, uh, since 1969, I've been doing self-portraits. In uh, 69, when I was working in Richard Meyer's office, I've been doing self-portraits every Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement, where you're supposed to look inward. I've just completed this one on COVID Yom Kippur, a triptych, cheating in a way. And I, it's the, now the 52nd of these, so it's more than half a century. It's a lifetime project, but 
It's not really a thesis, certainly not an architecture thesis, but I don't think it's even another kind of thesis. It's just a long project. But there is another which might qualify as a thesis. And that uh, had to do with, before I started teaching at MIT and writing Creation in Space, the second edition with Professor Diamond, I was able, I was teaching at University of Kentucky History and someone, a student there asked, how come we look in all these cathedrals and churches, but there's no history of synagogues? And I thought, that's a good question. So I wrote to the experts and found out that synagogues don't all have to be like movie theaters the way mine was when I was growing up, which opened up possibilities. And here are some of the studies of those details, uh, kind of uh, elaborating on what Rob was saying about the preoccupations of circle square triangle in three dimensions, complementarity and other stuff. So this could be a community design, not a house, like John Haydick's nine square houses or Eisenman's houses one through 10 and so on, but a community building. And what to call my first synagogue? Not number one, that was taken, but how about Hebrew? It could be Synagogue Aleph, which led me on a series, one for each of the Hebrew letters and Aleph Beit of synagogues. So I would say that this idea about synagogue might be considered a meta thesis, a kind of long-term set of theses, theses. And I'll show you a selection of those, uh, uh, one theoretical synagogue design, and they're all theoretical, for each of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, alphabet. I've just finished number 18, as Rob pointed out. It's taken almost half a century, about three years for each. It's a good thing there aren't 26 letters that like there are in the English language. That would be even longer. And it's a good thing it's not Chinese. That would be uh, much longer. But there is a vast literature on the meaning and significance of each of these Hebrew letters and char or characters. And that literature, in a sense, became the, the, revealed the spirit uh, behind each letter, which became the program. So I'm going to show you a few of those very briefly. The first one, as Rob mentioned, Aleph. Uh, this was one for, uh, we, cry, we had a, a, a wheel a water wheel that turned by the river that flowed by it to drive an Archimedes screw that lifted the water up to the roof where a solar still would purify it and then return it back to the river as a purer river, slightly. This river needed to be going from uh, east to west and it was hard to find those, most of them like the Mississippi and the Nile run north, south or south, north or whatever. But I nearby in Lexington, Kentucky where I was living at the time, just north of that was the Ohio River, a perfect fit. So this was a project for the Ohio River. And there were a lot of reasons why it was close to the promised land on the other side, where an expatriate New Yorker could get not only chili five ways, but a corned beef sandwich every once in a while. And then after a trip to Israel and the Sea of Galilee, where I saw an ancient synagogue there, it, which had windows in the midst of the rows of its library shelves, this raised the thought that the library was a set of windows and the window to the world was a book. Synagogue Gimel, the camel, the ship in the desert, uh, was Noah's Ark for Jones Beach. And it raised the question for me of how did every living thing, as the Bible says, fit into a 300 cubic arc, cubit arc? African and Indian elephants, mammoths, T-Rex, uh, genotype, not somatotype, test tube, DNA, seeds. Like the Jewish tradition of the Torah, the law, versus the Talmud, the commentaries. So there would be a life boat that would land on a beach and create an oasis ring. And when that matured, it would create the new lifeboat that would sit on top carrying the Torah and the genetic material of the DNA, however we do that, freezing or test tubes or whatever, for the next time and the next flood and the regeneration of this thing. Do we move? Yeah. Uh, Dalit means door. This had to do with refugees. I was running for city council. The architectural challenge was how to fit a family of four in a 12 foot cube. But these are temporary lodgings because they're refugees. So tight is okay before they get their permanent home. But the worshipers must pass below the refugees on their way to prayer, both before and after and in front of the refugees. Vav means and. And this one is the intersection of two tetrahedrons. I keep going the wrong way. 
which makes a six-pointed star of David in three dimensions. And the four points on the sides are coplanar, so this synagogue could hang from the party walls in a city that would be on either side of it between them. And here you see a view of that. And this is where I learned SketchUp because it's really hard to draw a, by hand a, uh, a triangular, the vanishing points in a triangular room with sloping walls. It's really hard to figure out how to do that, but SketchUp does that for you. And I like how Vav is both the name and also the party diagram of the intersecting tetra triangles uh, and the rendering here on the right of the beam of the prayer lectern. That was just got, I just got lucky. This one, Zion East of Eden, remains mysterious and complex and ancient. And when I learned Hebrew as a kid, the letters Het Tet Yud was a series like LMNOP in my ABCs. So the series here is your synagogue, my synagogue, our synagogue. Yours, the first one, Het, is about tradition. And it got me involved in rendering the Ten Commandments as stained glass and was very much about light. The next one, my synagogue, was based on my blessed days where I slept here and worked in this little studio at McDowell, an artist retreat up in New Hampshire. That was my holy temple. I slept there. They left a lunch basket quietly at the porch so it would not um, disturb me and my creative flow. And there was always half a quart of uh, split firewood for the fireplace. Did you need a rocking chair or a rolling board for pinning up? You got it. If not that day, certainly by the next morning, it was in your studio. Ours, I'm not sure yet. I don't know what it's about. It's hard to think these days about community or really any unity these days before an election, which is so crazy. But all of this takes me to about 2009, 2010, when I had an exhibition at the Ed Hall Gallery. And this was modeled and designed in SketchUp and InDesign allowed me to change all of the elements of the uh, design uh, at, even at the very last minute, I could be flexible about location of images, uh, size, location, color, all of that, uh, as I, as, to, even to the last minute of the plotting for these scrolls of wallpaper, as it turned out. It's a wonderful way to do a show. And since then, I've done 11 through 18 synagogues, numbers 11 through 18, mostly. Kaf, number 11, is about the crown and the hand. And the question became, who's on top? Who's the king? And that raised me to think about them versus of, us. And if them is the 1%, then the chances are you are with us. Them gets the spa above, you take care of the children and the child care. They get upholstered seats, you get, uh, fold, I'm sorry, they get upholstered seats, we get folding chairs. It's the shared volume of two intersecting cubes. And I'll talk about this one in a bit. And this one is about water in the desert. And it turns out that there's a way that you can dig a hole that will get you a quart of water every day from the sand in the desert if you do it properly with a little piece of plastic on top of it. So, and you need a quart a day for survival. So if you dig four of these, you get a gallon a day, which is enough to more or less stay healthy. If you spend 40 days and 40 nights digging, you get enough for 10 people, which is a veritable homemade flood, and you become the Noah in this oasis in the desert. And there is such a thing as solar sintering, which exists off the grid and allows you to turn sand into ceramic, building material, woven net, even glass. So that's what this project is about. None, the next one, is the inverse of men, and I have no idea what that means, but here's the letter, the character, Nun. Uh, known as here in the two mems beginning and end. Don't know what that's about. Sanctuary in the city was the question that was raised and security, sanctuary safety uh, for synagogue Samach. And this was a question of uh, the refugees. And a way to put them in the city was to house them in secret apartments with secret prayers. And they did that by giving up the perimeter for rental uh, units to the tenants. Here you see the stack of them. This is taken away. And then the refugees would be able to live in this interior way. And the way to make this work was to have a double helix of stairs that wrap around each other, but with a wall between them, remain invisible to each other. So the uh, tenants get the yellow staircase and the refugees is the white circulation. And with these common walls, they wrap invisibly around each other and the refugees can find refuge in that space. 
and I'll talk more about this one in a bit. And synagogue pay, as in pay up you bastards, this is about the bloated museum of treachery, to use Mr. Burns' words. And it's about the mouth and eating and speaking, what goes in and out, and it's also about the myth of Sisyphus. How do we build Florida when it's permanently underwater? There's no wood, just the limestone in the seabed. And if all you have left after the floods is only your remaining tool, your Swiss Army pocket laser, if it's solar powered and programmable, of course, then it seems to me it's easy to make fractal, manger sponge, lightweight stone structures that have the kind of character of bones. And then you could build uh, masonry spaces that you could lift each stone, theoretically, even though limestone's kind of heavy, you could do this. Uh, this one, pay, is worked out in some detail, but I can't come to closure yet, probably because I still have too much anger. Now we're going to take a look at three in more depth, uh, and I'm going to move to another uh, pack here, which I trust will go faster. Um, and that's this guy here. And let's go to uh, the slideshow from the beginning. How are we doing? You seeing that? Seeing Synagogue Glomid? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, we're gonna look at three projects in more detail in uh, a little bit of time, I promise. And I'm gonna mention that you can find more about all these things on my website, lushlight at gmail.com. And it pays to advertise. Uh, and in advertising, you must repeat. So here it is again, lushlight at gmail.com. Lamed means learning. So this was a synagogue where lifelong learning wrapped around the sanctuary. And to make a sustainable steady state of that, I came up with eight cohorts of uh, 26 people each. And they would go from ages one to 13, there'd be two of each of them, and then uh, 14 to 26 with two times 13 is 26 again, and so on, for eight cohorts total, ending in the one that goes from uh, 92 to 104. And if you reach the age of 104, it's enough. So at, from, uh, at 13, Jewish children become bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, and they become adults. So that was the kind of interval that I thought made sense to look at this. And we can trace around here how that works. This is house one for the cohort number one, and house two, cohort number two, three, two, house three, house four for careers, you move upward, house five, careers continue, house six, retirement, house seven, house eight, and then you look out and that's it. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful numerology in this one and I can't uh, take time. I will just mention that there, it involves among other things, a Friedman number, not me, but there is such a thing. So it's an interesting uh, mathematical little uh, toy. Anyway, the uh, left image shows the ground floor, the right image shows the upper cohort. Uh, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. The geometry was a nine square tartan grid with, as Julian calls it, the yellow peripheral distinction in existing in every section, every plan, every elevation. And again, there are a total of 216 major cubes in this space. So on the ground floor plan, the one on the right has the furniture, you see a classroom and a double height playroom, um, a conference room and the double height library for the scholars, the students, the, you guys, and then uh, a kitchen, with a double height dining because at from the ages of 27 to 39 you might be raising a family so you have kids you got to do cooking and all that they may as well do the cooking for everybody and then there's a um shop that's the ba the, ver the base for the vertical uh career climbing phase the upper level which you see here or the mezzanine of that area of these double height things has a nursery for the first cohort where babies can take naps and uh, carols for study above, and uh, a, a nice quiet uh, a cafe above the main dining space and the upper space of the shop. And then the upper levels have the seat, uh, the mid levels have the seating for the sanctuary where the uh, Ark of the Torah is right here, and offices for both the cantor and the rabbi, and then offices for the career minded on the corners. And above, we have the cohorts for seven, six, seven, and eight, six from 66 to 78, and so on. 
uh, six uh, from the uh, 66, uh, there's exercise and culture for the next one and a kind of museum for the last guys. And each of them has a mezzanine with some kind of medical services. In 66 to 78, it's emergency medical service. In 79 to the next one up, it might be more continuous medical service, but this is a place where people can come and go. And then the last one um, to the age of 104 would be palliative medical ser services after all. We're expecting the worst at that point. Uh, here are all the plans together. And in uh, Hebrew, high are the characters for 18, and that means life. So 18 is a significant word. And here you see the geometry is that there are 18 foot intervals with half intervals of nine, both horizontally and vertically. This is très difficile, as Le Corbusier wrote about Villa uh, Garsh. Since religious services can take place on any level, the Ark and Beamer are on an open elevator which can stop at any floor. Down here, here, and here are the positions of that elevator for different services at different times. Some interior views. And the upper left, we see the uh, cohort six, the 66 to 78 year olds, and they have a place where they can show the slides of their travels because in not too long ago, those are the ages where as you retire, you might get to travel. Now you can't retire and you can't travel either. Um, and the, uh, the last one, there's a little piece of a fireplace and they get a garden, which we'll see uh, in the next slide. And here's the garden that faces west. So you can look at the sunset uh, and here's the view from the other side across the sanctuary. And you can see the wheelchair looking out to the west of the sunset because that's when the day starts in Jewish tradition. So for those near death, it's nice to think of the new day every day as it gets dark. Synagogue Ayan, and there's only one more after this and they should go quickly. Ayan, the letter rides the diagonal. And it's, Ayan is a backpacker's lodge and lookout, which you might find as a synagogue up at the source of a mountain spring near the ridgeline of a mountain. In Hebrew, Ayan is both the name and the icon for I, as it is in many languages, actually. And it's a window to the community out and a window to contemplation inward. Red is out, blue is inward. And a view of this place on its mountain, uh, elevations. And look out, as well as look in. Looking at dimensions and programmatic and structural relationships. And here you're gonna see the plans where the diagonal cuts into the plan uh, on the left. And now we're moving down from the top down. So the left-hand plan is before you make a cut. And then the next plan down is on the right. And then you can track by the increasing black triangle how we're cutting into the mountainside further and further. And the same thing happens as you cut through the sections. Uh, there are issues about light. A synagogue must, ha must have a ner tamid, an eternal light. And it can have a menorah, a candelabra, seven art candelabra. The one in Jerusalem in the destroyed temple is written of as a certain size. So I reproduce that here because it's, it actually is in Le Corbusier's modular dimensions, hallelujah. I'm so thrilled by that. Um, and there were questions of acoustics and sound. And the heart of this thing is the uh, heat pumps that separate the spring water into cold and warm. The warm becomes a radiant floor to heat this mountainside building. And the cold keeps cooling the water until eventually it becomes ice. Ice is floating on top of the water. And then that ice can be removed and put back onto the mountainside to rebuild receding glaciers, Could, should we ever be able to get to that. But you can reverse the uh, entropy in local conditions like that. Here's that diagonal in three dimensions both ways. An exercise in uh, 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 sketch up, cut and fill in solids. It's a tricky business. Uh, here's some technical studies. And again, looking at water separation or fluid separation and the uh, radiant floor and the drain, which became a swimming pool and maybe a hot water fountain, uh, hot water pool, soaking pool. And a precision carving and the volumetric argument, the intersection of inner and outer inverted against the landscape. 
And ayin is a Hebrew letter made up of two others. The vav on the left is supported by the nun on the right. Just thought you should know. And uh, looking from inward out towards the uh, south, uh, uh, we see the, the, the Le Corbusier rabbi holding the Torah scrolls, the modular man. And as we move through this and move out and downward, we leave the building receding up above us and someday perhaps disappearing into an icy, as in I see upon a uh, reconstituted ice field, which may ultimately go to white. And here we get the last one, and I promise you this one's a quick one. The 18th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Sadiq. And righteousness is the same root as Sadaka, meaning charity. When so much news in our world is bad, we long for righteousness. Can righteousness be learned? Can it be practiced? Music may be a model for this. The tzaddik, the righteous person in tradition, engages in tikkun olam, which is repair of the world. Some say in every generation, there are 36 righteous ones who sustain the world, the lamed vavniks, the tzaddikim. Here in this arena of passion and compassion, we find an outdoor music stadium with a picnic area, snack bar, camping tents, pool, first aid, a music store under an elevated stage, and a dance plaza in the middle amongst, amidst 180 stadium seats. There's dining and sleeping for 36 at a time and other facilities. And cut into the ridge of the sloping hillside is the entry to a chapel, which you can see uh, in this slide as well here, passing underneath a balcony where Carlos Nakai, a Native American flute player, welcomes the sunset. All the world's music is available for a reborn liturgy, Shema Yisrael, Hear O Israel, the digital shards of electromagnetic radiation or light joined to make acoustic and visual music on demand, electronics. The open sky above is the Ner Tamid in the synagogue. It's open, it's just the sky. It's an eternal light. It's a synagogue requirement. And then coming back down to earth, the body and soul returns to the arena to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, heal the sick, shelter the homeless, and bring hope and joy to all. But for now, it's getting dark, showtime. A child, perhaps entranced by the stage, <clears throat> wants to play like these guys. And he catches Miles or Monk's back, uh, eye and who nods down backstage kid after the show. And he finds the secret stairs, comes up and takes a journey into the unknown. A uh, one o'clock jump, a giant step. And somewhere on the way, music lessons, the master's revelation, the metier to acolyte of the art and upright, this guy is my grandfather, and that's his orchestra, and he was my first music teacher. He taught me the violin, and I now play the piano. He played that too. These giant steps offer new prospects, a chance to meet others also on this way, kind of like students and faculty in the School of Architecture and Design. We get together, and we get to meet others on this way of mastering these, these arts. We dream of immortality, and we know with practice and dedication, if you got it, you might just make it. Welcome to this lodge. The spirit soars. Like a first day of studio, every year when the class is open, it's a new chance. Something good might happen this time, as it has before, probably. This building, this lodge, offers solo outbuildings and an ensemble central atrium. The perimeter private studio spaces are for practice and creation. This is a dichotomy like working at home and working in studio. And the outbuildings are where you do the wood shedding, the real work, just as Sonny Rollins did when he uh, re learned to play enough that he could make his famous recording, The Bridge, after playing uh, Nights on Williamsburg Bridge in New York. Here, the, uh, the wood sheds are a cave, cave, sorry, cabana, green, uh, greenhouse, and treehouse. And you might think of these as where you do your charrette.
But then there's also the central atrium for the big jam where all the musicians get together, the big central room, which probably is something like what happens in the design studio after hours when you pull all nighters with all your friends. So musicians or whoever are everywhere practicing, listening, making, playing, praying. This elite is self-elected, voluntarily unaware of the trials ahead and the rewards perhaps. Over her, overhead here, the plan on the left is south, on the right is the north. This is the north arrow as we look down on these plans. The order of these plans is practice left, pray center, perform right. These plans show distribution maintaining solitude and privacy and passages linking lodge to arena and perimeters engaging centers. The microcosm raises a question of objective capability. Can you do this? and this and that? An apprentice may say, I don't know. A journeyman may say, some, almost all of it, not sure. And the master will answer, well, yes, of course. So now let's begin the true adventure. A new dawn, after a night of all night music, it's time to return to the day jobs. We all know about that, of performance and service. But what a night for our young supplicant. In the atrium, are they still jamming? A stop on the way back for morning prayers, same chapel from the other side. The newborn neophyte becomes developing apprentice, a life of cheerful service, helping out in the arena and backstage as well. A beginner, but with the masters now. Another sunset, spirit ascends carried by the music. A new journey women and journeymen move out into the world. The music is the news. The music is the news. And the news is the music. Out into the night, the righteous bring life to the world. Healing the city, journeyman becomes master, Lamed Vavnik, Zen master, tzaddik, musician. Vagabonds may visit in the morning, homeless or returning masters perhaps, it's hard to tell. Or any of the 36 righteous who sustain the world. Oh, when the saints go marching in, how I wanna be in that number. Oh, when the saints go marching in, rivals reconcile and rejoin. The gifted serve the needy. Righteousness, tzaddik. Now I'm going to show you a very quick two-minute, I promise, video, if all goes well. Can you see that? And let's start the music. Here we go. You can hear it? The sound has to be shared through the system. I'm uh... uh, sorry. Say that again? You have to share, you have to change the settings of the sound controls in Zoom, but uh, it in might Zoom. be a little complex. Yeah. Okay, uh, how, tell me, go ahead. Is in, it under share? The problem is that then your mic is going to go off. So, okay, well, that's fine. I don't need my mic. So if you, if you go to Zoom, the, you have to change yeah. the set the, next to the mute. Okay. You have, you have to go to select a speaker. And okay, then you hang put, on a second. Sorry. Yeah. So I, I should stop sharing and just go to the Zoom? No, no. Just leave it oh, like I'm that. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mute. Next to mute, there is a little arrow. And then you can change the speaker or the mic. So choose, choose those to see which one would work in your system, because I don't know which your system is. No, that one is not working. But unmute, you can unmute yourself also. So. You are, you are muted, uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, you are muted. Jonathan. Jonathan. We cannot hear you now.
Jonathan, can you hear me? You are muted now and your, your mic is muted, but we don't hear the music either. You are muted and we don't hear the music either. We don't hear anything. You can hear me now, yes? Oh, yes, yes. Okay, now let's see if we get the sound. Yes. Hey, all right, sorry for that delay. Okay, let's do this. It was supposed to be smooth, but it ain't, I apologize. Let's go back to the beginning, uh, if I can get there. Okay, here's the film. Now, uh, let's turn that off. And uh, you're seeing Louis Armstrong, I trust? Yes. Good. I wanted you to see this one, but things were confused. Anyway, uh, there's only three more. Or any of the 36 righteous who sustain the world when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in, how I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in, rivals reconcile and rejoice. The gifted serve the needy. That's righteousness. That's tzaddik. Thank you. And that's the end. So I'm going to end the slideshow. And what do we got? We got Zoom. <laughs> uh, you can stop sharing now. Thank okay. you so much, yes, sorry. Uh, Jonathan. Thank you. Damn, it's, lecture. Okay, thank you very much, Pablo. Thank you for helping me through those things. Thank Pablo. you, Jonathan. Um, so I want to thank you so much for that illuminating presentation. At the very least, we have just taken a very extensive tour through the imagination of an incredibly creative and productive architectural thinker. I never cease to be amazed by the dexterity with which you weave narratives from diverse fields of knowledge and then weave them together into very succinct, um, concise architectural forms. Um, I have a few questions and comments that I'd like to offer, after which we will open the discussion to members of the audience. So I would invite you all to enter questions into the chat, and I will then read them to the speaker um, after my brief remarks. 
Um, so my impression is that this talk is really about the enduring question for students of architecture, which is how architecture communicates and whether or how utopian models are fundamental to the invention of meaningful architectures. The architectural historian and critic Lewis Mumford said, it is our utopias that make the world tolerable to us. And he distinguishes between utopias of escape and those of reconstruction. So I find the statement to be apt in relation to your work. In looking at four decades of projects, it is clear that you focus on alternatives to the often devalued social and institutional content in contemporary architectural production and discourse. Would you comment on this aspect of your work, especially for the students among us this evening? Gosh, David, that's a, that's a, a, a big scoop of stuff to have to manage. Or ignore um, it and just say something else. It's OK. No, no, no. Um, well, the thing about the reconstruction versus the, what we call just idealism in, a, in, a, in another way um, is an interesting uh, question, because somehow it's got to be like halfway between both of those, got to have a foot in each of those. And there is a tradition of architectural utopianism. We've got Ledoux, uh, we have Garnier, and we have Gradient City, and maybe Broadacre City is utopian or anti-utopian, I don't know. Uh, and certainly Solari, I think, more recently. Um, and all of those are working as if these could be built. Whether or not they should be built, I'm not so sure about uh, Ledoux's uh, things, but um, he gave it a shot when he was in inventing a whole bunch of architecture parlance or whatever we call that. Um, but when I, I, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, the real question is, what gets me started to do these things? And it's been very nice with the synagogues. All I got to do is read all those books and eventually something starts to appear. Sometimes it's very quick. I mean, lately I've been trying to sneak in, or most times I try to sneak in the, the Hebrew letter somewhere in the project. And sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it isn't. But I, I mean, first of all, I should make it clear to everybody, I'm not religious. And I certainly am not uh, somebody who goes to uh, any of the uh, things that local religious organizations have. We just don't do that right now. It's not easy. Um, but I was sort of raised in that. So I have this backlog of structures that I can play with and um, uh, change. But it's nice to have a client who will agree to anything you want. <laughs> uh, and therefore, it opens up the investigation to, you know, Bob Dylan says, to be outside the law, you must be honest. And I try to make these things answer real architectural issues like structure and how you build it. And, you know, I, until I had the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Swiss Army pocket laser, I didn't know how I could make the limestone be light enough to, for one person to lift a stone. And there's a whole other story about that. But, uh, and that's always a question, you know, how do you make this uh, in, in any sense uh, be plausible? Uh, but that's not the main problem. The main problem is kind of make the story clear. And lately, uh, especially my wife, Marilyn, has been insisting that uh, Sadiq especially required a narrative. <laughs> I thought, because I made the building and then, and then, yeah, but how do you, what do you do? How do you get through that and all that stuff? So hence the film and the narrative and, you know, and I, and I subscribe to trying to do it as cheaply as possible. So I try to use it as much free software as possible. So the film is made on the uh, Windows 10 Photos app for video. So it's low res and it's, uh, you can't do much with the sound and stuff and so on. But I don't know if that answers any of your questions, but I'm trying to respond. Maybe, well, that's great. Maybe, maybe more can answers will come to another one. Sure, if, please. If I may. Um, Absolutely. Because I think that, you know, though I can appreciate the discourse that the forms alone present, I think that there are parallel discourses of words and then the forming of words and letters, mm. yeah. um, which is kind of deeply fascinating. So the form of your narratives, which are deeply grounded yet remarkably open ended and the narrative of your forms, almost generic, interchangeable, suggests yeah. that both words and forms are equally essential to understanding your intentions in these projects. Well, the thing is, uh, David and everybody else, um, architecture was never easy for me. In fact, it was horrifyingly difficult and still is 
Um, and, you know, as you've heard me say before, when I look at Paul Amatuzzo's work, for example, it's like taking dictation from God, like Mozart. How does he do that? It looks like he gets it all in the first shot. And for me, it's always been much easier to write. And I was always, as you can tell, a verbal person. And to be visual and plastic and so on has come very hard. And unfortunately, I missed the chance to get better at that from an early age when I chose Princeton instead of Cornell, where I had a chance to learn architecture first. And, um, you know, so I'm a talker. I mean, you know, what, do you, what can I tell you? Uh, uh, so uh, I don't know if, if, um, if, uh, the, if I, I, I work hard, I, I do a couple of things. I work hard to make the writing fit the page and fit the space on the page. It's like a meta double cross stick that I keep doing. And I'll rewrite those things like I did for the, for the book, Home for Generations. When I first wrote Home for Generations, we didn't have graphic interface. So I had to set the text. And if there was a, a line that had one word that was five letters instead of four letters, uh, and, I need, and that would make everything screwed up. I would spend a long time looking for, instead of the word black, the word Evan, which was four letters that meant the same thing. And that would let me fit the space in. And now I still do, even though we have all these gra graphic editing things, I try to write the text to match the pages. So you don't have to turn the page and all that. And then I try to figure out where on the page it goes. And that should be a commentary. And it may well be that the words make much more sense than the pictures uh, in the end. But that is a dialectic uh, dialogue I, I really have with myself all the time. Is, is playing those things. And the other one that comes in, uh, which is exactly uh, part of that as well, is I really love graphics. I love two-dimensional arrangements, especially these days when you have so many toys to play with. And I'm, I was a little annoyed that when I was doing this presentation, I, I, I made all the, all the uh, uh, presentations in, in um, PowerPoint because late in the, in the process, I discovered if I made them in InDesign and exported them to PowerPoint as JPEGs, I could stay with the InDesign and find out where that particular image was linked to. And then I could go to that link and then update it and so on. And I have to make a new JPEG, but it was less tedious because in, in PowerPoint, they don't give you the links. They just have the pictures to play with. That kind of thing really gets, gets me as I'm playing all these different fluid um, media together, which I guess architects do to some degree. Although the lucky ones like our lecturer last week, he gets to do a lot of, uh, of, 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 of making pure spaces, which seems like a nice thing to be doing. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to make w one last comment, and then uh, we have a number of questions from the audience. Great. Um, so recently, Ken Frampton published a book called The Genealogy of Form, um, oh. Architectural Forms. And I was wondering, I'm sorry, Genealogy of Modern Architecture. Oh. And it occurred to me that in reading Tzaddik, that your work was at least the beginning of an etymology of architectural forms in the sense that you were kind of reaching back to the sounds of the words, the forming of the words, yeah. the form of the forms, the meaning of the forms. And I think there's something incredibly rich and, and worthwhile in pursuing that study. Um, looking at the forms of narrative, the narrative of forms, as if the acoustics of the spoken um, narrative were rather than a representation of the written text, they were themselves a kind of dialectical counterpoint to that text. Mm. But if you read the images, there's one set of meanings that's parallel, but yeah. the commentary on the written or spoken narrative. Absolutely. You bet. You bet. And that's, that's really fascinating. And I kind of love that about reading your work. Um, so I was fascinated by the unpacking of meaning of the letters of the alphabet, the alliterations, the numerical values and the poetry in your work. Well, um, so I guess you. that's more of a, uh, a comment. Well, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer think... that. I'll respond to that comment. I guess that's okay, what we're good, doing good. in this panel discussion. I don't, you know, uh, it's odd when we're also um, close but separated also. It's very odd, this whole methodology or this medium anyway that we're in. Um, uh, First of all, I just want to say, uh, Ken Frampton was my uh, professor at, uh, when I learned about the Russian Revolution. He had written a complete uh, manuscript on the Russian Revolution and Russian Revolution architects and so on. And we took that sem seminar. And at the end of the seminar, like the last week of the seminar, Anatole Kopp's book, Town and Revolution, came out. So that was 
my first lesson in how you could come close to getting something, but but and and doing all the work, but then not getting it, which you know helps me with things like that golf project. Um, but uh, when I was in high school, or actually when I was in junior high school, I was a published poet, and uh, in my senior year in high school, I won one of the uh, 500 in the country National Council of Teachers of English awards, along with a National Merit Scholarship. And so I was much, very much a wordy person back then and, you know, kind of like poetry, but I have a whole bunch right up above me of origins and entomology books um, right next to the thesauruses and so on, because that is really interesting. And I mean, and it's also uh, connects to like our origins, like what was it like when they invented fire? <laughs> and, and, you know, what was it? Apparently uh, Homo erectus, the, 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 species that invented fire. Also were the first seafarers, which is, I guess, how they got to Java. Um, from, they, they populated from Spain to Java. So, so these things uh, uh, kind of go around and come around, I guess. Maybe I'll stop there for, for the moment. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. I'd like to read some of the questions from the audience members. Sure. Um, what do you have to take in consideration when placing trees on top of an infrastructure? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's drainage and structure. And, and um, uh, if the question is referring, let's see, how many times do I have trees on top of infrastructures? Well, certainly the last project is the most evident one. Uh, can I ask the questioner to send in a chat? Are there any others that I should be addressing? Because uh, it's hard to remember these days. I, I think it's a tricky question, by the way. Uh, I don't know if it is referring to the High Line, for instance, or the cost of infrastructure yeah, in relationship yeah, yeah. to... Yeah, you know, well... Um, I mean, I'm pretty careful about things like that. And for example, in the last project, I mean, the trees, I think they all miss where uh, a lot of the excavation is. Or, or the, the forest to the west side certainly misses it. The forest to the north side of the lodge, um, maybe there's one uh, a passage corridor that cuts under those, but they're far enough above that I think the root structure would take care of that. Drainage, I'm not so worried about. There are ways to resolve that. But I want to point out, not necessarily the trees, but I spent a long, long time, weeks, solving the problem of the location of the grapevines for the grape arbor so that they could have wine, which was the purple stuff on the right side of the project on the, on the east side. And the reason for that was, at first I ran them parallel to the contours running east-west. But then I read it's better to run them north-south. They get better lighting that way. So I had to rotate all those things. And since they were double, that all of those little pieces were sloped in two directions on those hillside blocks, it was very hard to make them all line up again. But I did. So those are correct. And they're roughly correct in, in height. Uh, uh, grape arbor vine fences, at least from what I was researching about it. So when that kind of issue comes up and the plants are an issue, yeah, I, I, I would find that as a perfect excuse to find out something new <laughs> and then, you know, dig into the, uh, the library. That's one thing I'm very grateful for having the sabbatical because I could lose weeks at a time and not really worry about it, except, you know, there was plenty okay, to awesome. worry about. Next question is, could you describe yeah. some of the metamorphosis of Gimel from a pod to a sustainable community with the Taurus and the spheres? Um, I think the short answer is no. I mean, I tried. Um, I, I don't know if I can if I can go back to one of those images. I will I will put myself on the block for that. Uh, let's see if we can share. I have to share the screen. Is that what I got to do? Yeah, and I got to pick which one I'm sharing it. Um, oh, I, I'm sorry. Let me give me one second here. Uh, well, anyway, we'll share the screen first. And uh, are you seeing something? Yes. Are you seeing the, the, a kid playing with blocks? Which is not what I want to show, but I will, I will show this thing instead. Sorry, guys. I don't mean to delay things, but I appreciate the question. Uh, OK. Now, are you seeing, you're seeing the words as well? Because I have the wrong screen? Yes. Let me see the next slide with your notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I gotta go to the screen share and pick the other one. Now you see the full image, right? Perfect. Okay, of course it showed me the wrong slide, which is not so nice. 
but we'll try to run through this. Sorry about these technical difficulties. Damn, okay, this is no good. I may have to get out of this. It's gonna to take too long that way. I'm gonna end the slideshow and jump to another slide and show it from there, because that's what we wanted to do. That's what the question's about. Sorry again. Uh, Okay, you got that one now. That's what the question's about, I think. And um, the best I did, and I think I can zoom, is this sketch was where I kind of laid out what the sequence of how you would grow the bamboo, how you would catch the water and then make it not uh, catch the rainwater because it's near the ocean and salt water and then make these trays that would eventually cultivate bamboo that would make these as kind of uh, shelters uh, that would then allow you to grow plants and then eventually make other stuff with them and at the same time let's see if I can get this uh, uh, right here I'm sorry yeah uh, uh, this um, this little image over here uh, is uh, that piece right there is the uh, uh, solar glass factory so that these could be greenhouses. I mean, the sequence of these things, that was hard. I have to admit that. So I just punted it by showing you um, the, uh, the rendered globes and things. But the idea is that these things would make somehow a kind of oasis that would then uh, generate the other things. I spent more time looking at the details of what the synagogue would be with the classroom and the prayer area and uh, the other facilities that would be typical of a synagogue. And there are a lot more drawings of that stuff. Uh, but I don't know if that answers the question, but I'll stop sharing the screen and get back to this. Okay, th th this is a seemingly simple one, but it's actually me means you have to repeat the whole lecture, I think. So <laughs> I'm curious I'm as that. to where Professor Friedman got his ideas for each Hebrew letter, what it means and what it represents. Mm. Well, I think then I refer you to my website as a start, because a lot of these that I showed today are either in booklet form, which you can get to as a link, as a, as a PDF on the website, or they haven't been put up there yet because I haven't gotten to, around to all that documentation or over the years I've lost some of it. Um, but in general, um, I mean, again, 50 years ago, I just started and said, all right, I'm going to make a synagogue. How am I going to do it? I don't know. What am I going to call it? Well, it's the first synagogue. Whatever, you know, how about the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet? What does that mean? Like you say, David, about looking up the entomologies and all of that the genealogy of the entomologies or whatever. So I say, oh, Al Aleph, look at all these things it's about. There's a big fat chapter on that. And I read that whole thing and said, well, what does that have to do with anything? And it didn't have much to do with that one, although the, the plan takes that form in the axonometric. Um, but that was the, the way. And so then it was easy. The next one, I just go look. But I, I, I mean, again, I'm, I, I think there are long, there are many turns and a lot of these have a lot of sketches and, and and I, I would, and, and ever since SketchUp, which I still use, I mean, I know I'm supposed to use Rhino, but I'm, I'm archaic and I use SketchUp and it, you know, it works well um, for me. Uh, I must have uh, 20 gigabytes of, of SketchUp models uh, or 100 gigabytes for SketchUp models. And SketchUp's pretty efficient. So when you have a 100 megabyte SketchUp model and you have 150 of those, because uh, I want to change it, but I don't want to lose all that good stuff, so I'll save it. And, you know, those are the sketches, I guess, and that's the evolution. And some of the, some of the evolution is pretty ugly. <laughs> or, or let's put it this way: the early pro the early versions are really dumb, and sometimes they get better. That would be a whole other lecture to show you show you the the early uh, bad bad ideas about it. But what did I just do here? I I got myself out of the. Okay. Um, we have a, uh, another like question. You. Can the Vol, yeah. um, I really enjoyed the base synagogue. Are there hints of the Hervis synagogue in there? Uh, this is a question about your precedence. And I assume uh, that this is I, I think that was before Hervis synagogue. Let, let me say that was before I knew about the Hervis synagogue, I think, because I wasn't that good a scholar back then. But uh, it was sometime five or 10 years later that I saw a digital uh, reconstruction of the Herm or 
pre or actual construction of the Hervis Synagogue, which showed the magnificent lighting effects of that and the spaces that uh, Khan was making. And it was a revelation because the plans are so damn boring. They're symmetrical. It looks like there's nothing going on there. If uh, uh, Anthony Caradonna is here, they're symmetrical and boring, but it's a beautiful building. Uh, uh, and, and all I would say about Bait is the drawings I made, which again is uh, when I couldn't draw very well. So the way I put that dome on the square boxes below it is very crude. Um, you know, I would have liked to have reproduced That's one of my it favorites. better. What's that? That was one of my that, favorites of your drawings. Oh yeah, well, um, and I would, and you did see how I got the the, the six pointed star in the perspective there. Um, that was the one that was part of the uh, window room furniture show. I remember that. Yeah. Okay. Todd Williams uh, spilled coffee on the original. Can the vase also be seen on the original as drawing. sacred geometry or extension of the Merkaba? I'm sorry. Say it again. Can the Vav also be seen as sacred geometry or extension of the Merkaba? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Why not? I mean, I just, I, one thing I did not mention is that the plan of Vav, when I put it into the space of, I think it's Temple Emanuel in the upper West 80s, it fit almost exactly there, which is why I showed that in the, in the view. And the other thing that it did, which was a thrill, was that the one set of the triangular geometries, uh, let's say the, the facade edge, is par if that's parallel to the city grid of New York, then the other rotated triangle geometry uh, is aligned with north and south. And when they lock together, I went, oh, that's great. <laughs> so I don't know about uh, Merkava or that stuff really. Okay, so there's just uh, two more. One is a comment and then the last one is a question. Um, so much of Judaism is based on community and the need to have a minion of 10 men. It is so refreshing to see your synagogues which house its own community as opposed to typical places of worship, as you call them, movie theater synagogues. Your mm. Aleph Bet synagogues are so full of spirit in so many ways. Well, thank you. But I want to point out these days, you can't say 10 men. You got to say 10 people. Ten, and it was really persons. hard for me to, and it was really hard for me to figure out how to change the word journeyman, which is such a common word, to journey persons didn't work. And so I snuck in journeymen the first time, but the second time I used it, I made journey women and journey men. But it's really tough to do those things. So I, you know, and there's some people who think it's still only 10 men for a minion, but they should ask their mothers. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, again, it, for me, that, that discovery of, of that uh, minimal liturgy, the minimal uh, plan requirements were, were nothing, and they had nothing to do with the space. It was just like pieces and aiming directions and so on. So after that, you could do anything you wanted. And that was truly liberating. That was like, oh, I have this toy to play with now. Otherwise, it was a chore. Um, Alex Gorlin has done some synagogues that are really interesting, that are very much about the Kabbalah and so on. And I respect him for that. As among, uh, He's the guy who did that wonderful analysis of uh, the governor's palace at, at Shanagar. Great. Um, next question. Some of your projects seem to be location specific, while others look to be more universal and where they could exist. For instance, the home for generations um, or Gimel. At what point in your projects do you decide this? How does it impact the project itself? Okay, well, just to set the record straight, Gimel was not really site specific. It could go on Jones Beach. And when I said that, I, I said that, and it did piss off my parents that I would be talking about these crazy things that way. But I thought about it and I thought, well, Noah's Ark landed at Mount Ararat, they say. And when the waters receded, where it landed was the edge of the water and the earth or the land or the rock or whatever. And what oceans do is they erode that and turn it into sand. So there might have been a micro strip of beach or a big piece of beach when it settled. So beach is the intersection of land and water or, or you know, earth and ocean. And therefore, it was only site specific that it would be on any beach. It didn't have to be on that beach. And Hope for Generations for sure could go almost anywhere. And I just said it, it came from my experience growing up in suburbia. But, uh, you know, more in another way, I would say that the last project, um, Sadiq, 
where there's that ridge line was very site specific to the idea that it had to be a ridge that ran a certain way, which was east west. And the slopes had to drain in certain ways. And I had to figure out how the cars would go up and that the ramp for the cars was not too steep and all that stuff. But that's different. And again, so, and, 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 and the other one, um, Iron, which is on a mountain ridge line, um, and it could even be on both sides. Those things are somewhat, site, uh, you know, generically site specific, I guess is what I would say. Okay. Um, and finally, um, question, um, this one from Bill Gotti, who has just uh, hey, opened up his video. Um, you are showing some freestyle jazz musicians, but the form you use is more Baroque. <laughs> How does the form derive from jazz? Did you ever How consider form... a more plastic freestyle form? Well, I hesitate to answer the jazz master pianist who's asking the question. Um, <laughs> I will just say, Bill, that in my own studies, which are very, very slow but dedicated, um, I have just gotten to the point where I'm trying to look at chord extensions like ninths and elevenths and thirteenths. So um, I don't know about what's Baroque and what's not in jazz, but uh, I, I will say that the last, that the piece of music that went with the film was Carlos Nakai, who I mentioned before, playing uh, that flute music. And when I played that on this uh, 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 Windows software, it magically fit almost exactly with that uh, sequence in the film. I mean, it was just, I mean, the, the animation and the, and the sound went together. I couldn't edit that. So it, I, once it happened, I let it stop. And then the other day, I was playing something that was a uh, duet by Lester Young and, and uh, um, uh, Teddy Wilson. And it was the same tempo and in the same key. And I could play it over both of them. And that was amazing. So that was getting to be Rococo, I guess, because the layers on concatenations of that. But I don't know about jazz and Baroque and, and my buildings is Baroque. I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I come from a purist tradition uh, and a Cubist tradition. So if it's Baroque, it's uh, Cubist Baroque, whatever that is. All I can say is maybe, maybe you should put a picture of the modern jazz quartet in your um, last project. It, you know, there were- Oh, okay. Um, um, you saw, um, uh, uh, obviously you saw Thelonious Monk, yeah. and I think I have Leonard Cohen in there. And at one point I had, um, uh, well, and you also see uh, scenes from uh, Black Orpheus. Yeah. Uh, so there's Bossa Nova and, and, and Billie Holiday. But the idea was all of those could be changing all the time because oh. it's a digital thing. Right. And therefore they were just represented, you know, a slice of that. And that image of, of Monk is so great that I thought I could use that one the most. Yeah, I really but, enjoyed uh, it. A wonderful well, thanks, Bill. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, I thought about you lately and in, in your musical accomplishments. We should, we should definitely get together. It'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Okay, okay so I want to thank everybody. Um, if anybody wishes to unmute and uh, continue the conversation, you're more than welcome to do so. I apologize for not always announcing who the uh, persons are who ask questions because many of them actually are friends of Jonathan and contacts from NYT and other places over the years. So my apologies to all of you, but if any of you wish to join in now, that would be great. Um, and then I would turn this back over to uh, Rob and or Pablo to remind folks about the next event in our lecture series. Rob, you want to? Sure. Uh, thanks, thanks everybody for for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. It was wonderful. Thank you, Rob. Talk. Thank you, David, for your uh, moderation and wonderful questions. So our our next event is on October twenty first, and it is Nada Vesugian who will be talking about Alvar Alto. Ernest Neufert and the politics of standardization in times of war. So we look, we look forward to that event. And then, so right after that, on the 28th is the book launch um, by uh, Marcelo Del Signore uh, on data, matter, design, strategies, and computational design. So hopefully we'll be able to see you all again at those two events. So if there's no more questions or comments,
I think we can. Well, I, I just want to say thank you to all of you for uh, uh, making a this possible and, and doing such a good job of setting a context. Boy, I can't wait to get copies of your notes, David and, and Rob. I mean, it's interesting stuff. Um, and I want to thank everybody who stuck it out to the end. And I want to say hello to some old friends along with Bill. I mean, and Andrew uh, Kaplan and Ivan Kreitman and my goodness, all kinds of other people. It's great to see you guys or to see that you're there. Hi, Behan. Anyway, thank you. And I'll, I'll hang on for a while unless, uh, well, I don't know who turns it off, but I'll stay here for a bit. Well, I just want to... Yes. Give you a round of thank applause. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you so thank much, you. Jonathan. So maybe, thank Susan, you. we can stop the, the live Facebook and Jonathan can stay. Uh, Perfect. I'm also going to say, can I say one more thing? Thank you, Jonathan. I want to say one more thing, which is, I think it's fantastic that the school is doing so well staying intact these days. And we should certainly thank Maria for that, but I think it's great that faculty and students and everybody is just going as if this is nor not, not normal, but as if this is workable, which is really wonderful. It's fantastic.